part of our Wisconsin Vote 2012 election coverage. And good evening. Welcome to the U.S. Senate Republican primary debate. We're coming to you live tonight from Madison. Our debate is a collaborative project of Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Public Radio, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and today's TMJ4. I'm Frederica Freiberg of Wisconsin Public Television. And I'm Charles Benson of today's TMJ4. Who will replace retiring U.S. Senator Herb Cole in November? Four Republicans are on the ballot in next Tuesday's primary election. They are running for the right to take on Democrat Tammy Baldwin in the general. Here's the list. Jeff Fitzgerald grew up in Houstonford, Wisconsin. He's the former state assembly speaker. Eric Hovde is from Madison. He's currently a real estate executive. Originally from East Troy, Mark Newman is the former U.S. representative of Wisconsin's first congressional district. And Tommy Thompson of Elroy is former Wisconsin governor as well as former U.S. Secretary of Health. In addition to watching or listening to tonight's debate, you can also join our live web chat. You can join in the conversation by going to one of our debate partners' websites, wisconsinvote.org, jsonline.com, or today's tmj4.com. You can also follow debate updates on Twitter by tracking hashtag WIS2012Debate. All right, now we are going to divide the hour-long debate tonight into two topic areas. The candidates will discuss the economy and jobs in the front half, health care in the second. On the former, as Wisconsin Public Radio's Sean Johnson explains, economic recovery nationally and in Wisconsin might be best described as anemic. The latest national unemployment rate remains static at 8.3 percent. In the last month, the nation saw an increase of 163,000 jobs, better than projected, but still described as too weak to reduce the jobless rate. In Wisconsin, the unemployment rate ticked up slightly in June to 7 percent, and state labor statistics show a loss of an estimated 11,700 private sector jobs during the month. Those job losses occurred across sectors, including manufacturing, leisure and hospitality, construction, and business services. Economists say uncertainty dominates the economic situation. Uncertainty in Washington over what November elections will mean for taxes and budgets and health care. Uncertainty over the European debt crisis, which affects U.S. exports. And uncertainty over the federal budget cliff coming in the new year. Some manufacturers say the uncertainty has them putting hiring on hold. That was Sean Johnson reporting. Now that so-called fiscal cliff would happen in January of 2013 when automatic federal spending cuts of $1.2 trillion over 10 years kick in under the Budget Control Act. At the same time, the President Bush era tax cuts will expire. Well, with that as the backdrop, we will begin the debate. Here's the basic format. Each of the candidates will have 45 seconds to answer a question. Frederica and I will ask follow-up questions to individual candidates as we see fit. And with that, we begin, and we begin with Jeff Fitzgerald. You have 45 seconds. As we just mentioned, uh, the fiscal cliff uh, could kick in, in in January 2013, and government spending and jobs are often connected. So with that in mind, this, this fiscal cliff could put in jeopardy thousands of jobs in places like Oshkosh Truck and Marinette Marine. How do you save these jobs if the goal is to cut spending and reduce the deficit? Well, you have to be competitive in the global market, and that's what we're not anymore. Um, when we look at, at how we face uh, the corporate tax uh, the, the rate that we have right now, 35 percent, the highest in the industrialized world, we're not competitive. Uh, we talk about the uncertainty with businesses. That's the problem that we have in the regulatory climate. You also have, when you look at uh, where we are from a financial standpoint, $16 trillion in debt. That's going to create uncertainty out there as well. Until we get our spending under control in Washington, D.C., it's going to create instability and uncertainty for businesses uh, around this country. So become more competitive in, in both uh, the tax climate and also in the regulatory climate. Eric Hovde, 45 seconds. Sure. Look, the reason why I entered into this race is because I saw with, like so many Americans, with disgust on how we couldn't reach meaningful budget cuts over the next decade. They started off with $4 trillion, they moved down to $3 trillion, then $2 trillion, then a super committee, and then they ended up with a trillion and a half through a sequestration process. It's fundamentally wrong. 
we have a very significant debt crisis. And I ask people to put your business hat on. Are you going to make an investment in a business that's going to hire maybe hundreds of employees if you think the federal government's going to go off an economic cliff in another two to four years because of the amount of debt and end up where Spain is? I see I'm running out of time, so I'll move on. Mark well, I'm the only candidate in this race that has been there before and done this before. When I was in Congress for four years, we put together plans at that point to balance the federal budget, and I've done it again. We took six months to lay out a plan specifically to lay out how we would get to a balanced budget in a five-year period of time by cutting $1.4 trillion of spending and repealing Obamacare. And to specifically answer your question, I know we can't read these, but we actually laid out 150 specific line item entries as to what we would eliminate in this budget plan. The numbers are in here. The plan is put together. I've done this before, and we're ready to do it again. Um, when we see the money not going into the federal government, that is when government cuts spending, that leaves more money in the private sector. When businesses and entrepreneurs have access to that money instead of the government, that's how you create economic growth and development in an economy. And that's why bailouts don't work. Tommy Thompson. The only way you're going to be able to do this is get elected. And the first uh, thing I would have to point out is that I'm the one that can get elected in November. And then you can start on developing programs. I've done this. I was the governor of the state of Wisconsin when the state of Wisconsin was going through a terrible problem, just like the federal government. We cut taxes 91 times. We created 742,000 jobs, and the people believed in me, and the companies believed in me. What we have right now is a lack of confidence. We're not going to get this turned around until after the election, and then people have a belief that we're going to be able to do what is necessary to avoid this fiscal cliff. Cut corporation taxes at 25 percent and cut some other taxes. Initiate the movement forward. So what I'm hearing from all of you is spend less, cut more. But when you're talking specifically about jobs in Wisconsin, Oshkosh Truck, Mercury Marine, they're tied to government spending. And if you make your cuts, should people with those types of jobs worry? You can start with Eric Hubde. Look, the simple fact, we have to engage in austerity of government and growth of our private sector. If we don't, we'll head down the same path that Greece and Spain has. Spain has an unemployment rate of 25 percent. A youth unemployment rate for those that are 25 years old and younger, a 54 percent. Yes, it's going to require some tough medicine, but for me to stand up here and tell you otherwise would be disingenuous. So yes, we're going to have to cut government spending, and it will have an impact. But if we can accelerate up the private sector through pro-growth policies, like reforming our tax system, lowering the corporate tax rate, deregulating the economy, and a whole host of other things, we can get our private sector moving that will absorb those jobs. Mark Newman, I wanted to ask you, do, you, do your cuts include cuts to defense spending? And, and if not, how do you realistically get out the deficit without going there? We have a lot of specifics laid out in this plan. Uh, everything from small dollar things like why are we spending $400,000 uh, to study how cocaine affects the, the sex habits of a Japanese Def quail. But we also have very substantive things like reducing the size and scope of the non-defense workforce by 15%. Do we look at defense? Certainly we look for waste in the area of defense and duplication of programs and that sort of thing. Um, to your question specifically, should people here in Wisconsin be worried? When we wrote our budgets when I was in the House of Representatives, when we did this before and we got to a balanced budget, we reprioritized spending, keeping defense as the highest priority of our government and putting less priority on social welfare programs with the understanding that people need to take more personal responsibility for themselves and their lives and less government. We'll move to the next question, Yes, Charles. and the next question will begin with Eric Hubde. Uh, much has been said wait about President I, Obama's... Wait, 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 just Well, then one. jump in, because we're asking follow-up questions, so you have an answer to that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I thought I was going to be able to answer this question. Yeah, that we're asking follow-up, so if we ask follow-up specifically to candidates, they get to respond. If you would like to respond to that question, go ahead. Well, Tom first Tom. off, what I did when I was governor is that I cut every program by 5%. When I first came, before I even got elected. And I'd do the same thing with the federal government. I would come in with a balanced budget, require every, including defense, and ask every department to come in at a 5% cut. Everybody complained, but the truth of the matter is the state government never ran better. And the same thing will happen to the federal government. When I was Secretary of Health, I asked for the opportunity to reprioritize the department. I could have cut up billions, but they said, no, you can't do that. Only Congress can do that. So I'm going to give Congress the opportunity to pass a balanced budget with a 5% reduction to every department, and you will find that secretaries are going to come in with innovative ideas 
in order to reduce budgets and duplicated programs. We feel we, we need to give you an opportunity as well now at this yeah, point. Yeah, you know, as Speaker of the State Assembly, I came into a session and faced the largest deficit we had ever seen, $3.6 billion deficit. And everybody told me, Mr. Speaker, you're never going to solve this in one session. We not only took that $3.6 billion deficit and cut spending, but we turned it into $150 million surplus for the state and did it without raising taxes. But you know what it takes? It takes having political courage. It takes making tough decisions. And that's what people elected us to do last session. So when you're looking at these tough decisions, the same way we took on collective bargaining reform here in the state, the same thing has to happen on the federal level when it comes to entitlement reform. When you look at Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and the interest on our debt, by the middle of next decade, every dollar coming into the federal government will have to go for just those four programs. So you know what? It can be done, but we don't have a taxing problem in Washington. We have a spending problem, the same way we did here in Wisconsin. So make those tough, tough choices. But in the end, I think people see what you do, and they're, they're going to reward you for it politically. And just so you know, we'll have the opportunity sometimes to follow up questions. We may follow up specifically one of the candidates. You'll have uh, the time you need to answer that question. We're going to go back now to the question where you will now have 45 seconds to respond. And Eric Hufty, you will go first on this one. Much has been said about President Obama's you didn't build it comment. What role do you think government should play in helping businesses start up or grow? Is there a role for government to help businesses grow? First of all, I found the comment so appalling and insulting to all entrepreneurs. Where did he think the money came from? The money tree fell out of the sky. It was through the hard work of entrepreneurs and their colleagues that built businesses that allowed the government to tax those businesses to build those roads, to hire those firefighters, those police officers. So I, I think it was such a disingenuous comment and really a slap in the face to the whole business community. As it pertains to government getting involved, I think we should let the private sector work. I don't believe in government picking winners and losers through our tax code, through regulations, through specialized earmarks, any of that. It's private sector decisions that will make far better informed decisions on where to allocate capital and investment and grow our economy. The single most important thing that government could do to help business today is playing get out of the way. Um, we started our business, I'm the only person here that spent 30 years in business here in Wisconsin, uh, creating jobs in Wisconsin for plumbers and roofers and all the folks that are involved in building houses. And I want to say this loud and clear, Barack Obama, by the grace of God and hard work, not government, we built our businesses. And to understand the role of government, we need to understand that government is in the way in slowing the growth and development. When the government borrows $1.3 trillion out of the private sector every year to fund their deficit, that's money that's not there for, and available for our entrepreneurs. I've traveled the state with the Tea Party, Tea Party Express with their endorsement this week. And all over the state, I heard from business people that can't borrow the money so they, they can grow and expand and create additional jobs. Government needs to get out of the way, balance their budget, leave the money in the private sector, and let the entrepreneurs work. We're just overregulated. We're overtaxed. Give the free enterprise system an opportunity to work. And it'll work. I've been involved in the business community for the last seven years, and we've been creating lots of jobs and businesses that I've been involved in and starting. And you know something? Didn't ask the government, but we were able to make things work. But when I was governor, we had some problems. The problem was is that we had a poor transportation system. So I rebuilt the state of Wisconsin with the help of, of a lot of people. And we built four lane highways, east and west, north and south. And the business community expanded. And they, they were able to create 742,000 jobs. We didn't help them, they helped themselves, but we built the infrastructure and that's what government needs to do. You know, we ran on two things last time when I took over as speaker. We're gonna get people back to work here in Wisconsin. We're gonna take care of the fiscal mess we were under. In the month of January, we came out with 10 pieces of legislation that we signed into law, myself, Governor Walker, and, and my brother, Senator Fitzgerald, that really were designed at getting government out of the way, of putting those policies in place that are going to allow business to either expand or locate here to the state of Wisconsin. And we've seen a lot of success. You know, when you look at some of the rankings, CEO Magazine jumped us up in the rankings for Wisconsin and places to do business. Just about a month ago, another report was done that we had now jumped eight spots. 
so that Wisconsin is one, I believe, 17th or 18th best place to do business. So you can put those out there, but get limited government and, and get government out of the way to create those jobs. We're going to move along to our next question. This one first goes to Mark Newman. It's on the issue of bailouts. Um, consider this scenario, if you will. Uh, you're in the Senate, and there are signs that the financial system is in imminent crisis. Two major U.S. banks have collapsed, and economists worry others may follow. Would you support any kind of government intervention, and if so, what kind? The answer, the answer is no. We need a free market system to work in America. But you've hit on a very important topic here with these bailouts. I'm a home builder. I have many good friends that struggled through this recession and didn't make it. And I want to tell you something. The federal government did not bail my good friends out. They're sure they're competitors, but they're my good friends. And I watched some very fine business people not survive. And the government was taxing these people as they were going down, trying to figure out how to survive and taking that money and using it to bail out big business. No, that's not the right way to go in America. We need the free market system to work. I feel for those people that are in our industry and didn't make it through this recession. We were very fortunate in our company, and we have. We've turned a corner. We'll provide about 450 jobs here in Wisconsin this year, but a lot of my friends and competitors did not make it, and the government did not bail them out, so I do not support government bailouts. Tommy Thompson. No, I do not. I do not believe that we should be bailing out and helping the banks. We tried that once before. It was a dismal failure. Solyndra was another dismal failure, and every time Barack Obama tries to pick and choose the winners, we end up as taxpayers paying for it. This is going to be awfully tough love. There's going to have to be some tremendously tough decisions. And tough decisions mean that you're going to have to vote no, and you're going to have to say no more stimulus. But there is a way to really stimulate the economy. Repatriate $1 trillion offshore. Money that companies have made, paid taxes in other countries, they would love to bring it back home. And you could have tr a trillion dollar stimulus owned, operated by the private sector, creating jobs, economic development all over this country. There are ways to allow the private sector to do it. Jeff Fitzgerald. Yeah, no, I, I would not either vote uh, to, to bail out. I, and, and I think uh, uh, Mark Newman hit it on the head. You can't pick winners and losers of who to bail out and who not to bail out. And plus, this you know created a whole other thing of, of really uh, creating uh, big banks that are you know uh, too big to fail. And I think when you look at that and look at some of the policies that came out of that and, and you look at Dodd-Frank, something that should be repealed that really has hurt our economy and hurt community banks here uh, all over. I've heard from, from people in the state of Wisconsin and, and hurt really uh, all over the, the entire country of, of not being able to borrow, not being able to capitalize. Uh, the cost of lending has gone up. And that really has hurt our economy to drive and bring jobs back, which we should be focused on instead of having uh, the taxpayers foot the bill all the time. Eric Hovde? Well, this is right in my wheelhouse. As the biggest critic of the Wall Street bailout and how it was structured, I was disgusted in all aspects of it. But let's also be very honest. If you are going to crater not the investment banking system, they should have been allowed to fail and was appalling that Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs were able to run off and get bank holding company charters. But if you were going to crater the commercial banking sector where people will no longer be able to show up and get their deposits, and you have a bank run to the magnitude that we had in the Great Depression, where businesses, individuals go to their bank and they can't get their money out, then obviously you're going to have to do something to save the system. But if you're going to do that, then you have to put repercussions on the CEOs, replace them, and the cost of capital should be extraordinarily higher. We need to leave you there on your sure, 45 seconds means. on that particular question. We're going to move on to the next question, and Tommy Thompson, you will be the first to answer. Uh, each of you wants to lower the taxes or tax rates and get rid of the loopholes like exemptions, deductions, and, and credits. So which would you eliminate? What specifically do you want to see eliminated to try to uh, lower tax rates? Number one, I want to be able to have a balanced budget. Secondly, I want to be able to allow individuals to be able to choose what kind of a tax you want. Do you want to go through the individual taxes or do you want a flat tax that you could fill it out during the halftime of the Green Bay Packer Bear game and still have enough time left over to get a glass of beer? Number three, I want to reduce the corporation income taxes down to 25%. It's the highest in the world. You're not going to have a competitive society, and you're not going to get the economy going with corporation taxes in the United States being the highest on business. Fourth, I want to be able to repatriate a trillion dollars offshore and put it into the economy so that we are going to be able to grow this economy, create jobs, and as Ronald Reagan once said, 
grow the pie so that we're going to be able to continue the tax cuts and be able to stimulate the economy. That's what has to be done. Yeah, I believe we need to simpl simplify the tax code as well. Um, when we look at corporations, uh, you know, we, we talked about this before, 35% were not competitive with other countries. It, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, are you going to locate your corporation here, pay 35% when you can go to another country and pay 15%? Um, when it comes to a flat tax, I agree with the governor. I, I think if you're making zero to $50,000, uh, you should pay a 10% flat tax rate. If you're a married couple, zero to 100,000, uh, pay a flat tax of 10%. Anybody above that, I think, should be at 25%. So simplify the code. Uh, you, you would see increased revenues, I believe, from that. And uh, I think that's the direction we should head. And, and I think that's what people would uh, like to see, a much uh, simpler code. Eric Huffman. Let's Let me address the question that was asked. What would you eliminate? Right. We have $151 billion worth of corporate welfare. I believe we need to get rid of all of it. We have things like tax credits for a rum distiller in, in the Virgin Islands. Or how about depreciation, depreciating a two-year-old racehorse? That is cronyism at its worst. I w went up throughout the state talking about my tax plan, lowering the rates from 35% to 25% and hopefully get it lower, get rid of the corporate welfare, because what do we cause? A distorted free market system, where if a company like Goldman Sachs, that has 84 offshore corporations, that pays nothing in tax, and small businesses, be it a community bank or small asset management firm, that is paying 35%, they can't compete in that economic environment. I, I want to ask you each, actually, just a yes or no question. Oh, did, did we not? I'm sorry. I want to get Mark I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm jumping in. Um, I, I want to start with the fundamental key question that I think that every conservative in America would ask when you talk about tax reform. After the tax reform is passed, is there more money in the pockets of government and less money in the pockets of people there for revenue enhancement to government, or is there more money in the pockets of people and less money in the pockets of government? So I'm totally in favor of an overhaul of our tax code that I think is ridiculously out of, out of, out of whack, but I want to make sure that when the tax code is changed, that what it doesn't become is a massive tax increase on the American people. So the first criteria in any tax reform that I look for, at the end of the day, does the government have more of the people's money or do the people have more of their own money? Now, having said that, flatter, simpler, fairer, and in general something people can understand is what we need to do with our tax code. I wanted to ask this yes or no question and I apologize for jumping in earlier. Um, one of the deductions that a lot of people can relate to is the deduction for the home mortgage. Is that something each of you would remove? Jeff Fitzgerald? Uh, no, I would not remove that. I would not remove it right now because it would be devastating to our housing market. Our housing market, when you roll in the housing market itself, new housing construction, all the ancillary industries, you're talking about 30% of the economy. We cannot remove it at this point in time. Mark Newman? I'm a home builder by trade, and I know how devastating that would be to our economy. I would not vote for that. Tommy Thompson? We're never going to grow this economy until we get the housing and construction back. And this would be devastating to take away this itemized deduction. This is the most important deduction because it helps to inure the benefits that grow the economy. We now go to Fitz, uh, Jeff Fitzgerald with our next question, and it is, how do tax cuts for high income earners create jobs? Uh, because most of the, the people that fall into that category are small business people. And we look at, you know, the Bush tax cuts and, you know, you, you see our president who just a few short months ago said, you know what, uh, we have to extend these tax cuts because the economy is too soft right now. And now we've seen him do a complete 180 on that and now say that he wants to, uh, to let those tax cuts expire. But you're hitting people that have businesses that their taxes flow through their personal income and that's going to hurt small business in the state of Wisconsin and throughout this whole country so when you talk about those tax cuts you're not just talking about that you're talking about small businesses that really are the driving force at getting our economy back going again we wanted to um slightly alter that same question for the other three of you because you are all uh, multi-millionaires and we wanted to ask you how many jobs have you created because of the Bush tax cuts and and how many people might you lay off if your personal federal income taxes went up well first of all that's very hard to sit back and calculate how many jobs did you create but let's talk about basic economics Capital formation and capital investment is predicated largely where it goes on two things. The cost of production, which labor's a big part of it, and your tax environment. 
Capital's mobile. I can wire money today anywhere around the world. So if the tax environment in the United States of America is punitive, that capital will move to Canada or it'll move to Singapore or someplace else. And it's time that the left and Tammy Baldwin and her allies start to understand just basic economics. So, it, but getting to your question, it's hard to sit down and do that calculation. But obviously, the more capital that is kept in the private sector, the more jobs that we can hire. Mark Newman. Well, I've been in business now for 30 years here in the state of Wisconsin. I remember when I started, it was pre-Reagan, actually, and, and we had 70% tax rates when we computed everything in. And it'd get to be October of the year, and I'd stay home and wouldn't go to work in, in the morning. I'd go pheasant hunting because I enjoy hunting because it didn't make sense to go to work with those high tax rates. And then the tax rates came down. And we started seeing that we could invest the capital that we had in our hands instead of in the hands of government and put people to work. I can tell you today that we'll build probably 150 homes here in Wisconsin this year. That's 450 job opportunities. This private sector work experience, much like what Ron Johnson has, building business and creating jobs here in Wisconsin, is what really matters. If you take money away from us, it's clear that we, uh, the money that we have goes into building our business and building more speculation homes, and which puts more people to work. It is a very clear relationship between tax rates and the number of homes we can build. Tommy Thompson? I was president of LHI, and while I was president, we went from 150 employees to 950 when we sold out. And uh, when I was chairman of AGA, we went from uh, 125 employees to 300 employees. That's over a thousand. When I was chairman and still am of Careview, we've gone from a startup company until right now we have 75 employees. Uh, so that's about a thousand employees that I've helped create, been involved with since I've been on the private sector. But I really, you know, dislike the fact that we want to divide America. I mean, why do we want to put us in classes and subsects and so on and so forth? People with money, our capital, they're the ones that we need to encourage to invest in small business and grow jobs. That's the free enterprise system. That will make America strong. Why don't you guys sit back for a few seconds here, and I want to remind you at home that you can join us with comments about tonight's debate by joining our online chat. You can join the conversation right now on any of our depart, uh, debate partners' websites, wisconsinvote.org, jsonline.com, or today's tmj4.com. You can also follow debate updates on Twitter by tracking hashtag WIS2012Debate. We shift gears now into the second topic of the evening. Let's look at the health insurance status in Wisconsin. Sean Johnson of Wisconsin Public Radio helps us get started with that. In Wisconsin, about 9% of the population, or just over 510,000 people, currently have no health insurance. According to a study commissioned by the State Department of Health, the Affordable Care Act would increase the number of people insured in Wisconsin by 340,000 by the year 2016. Right now, according to the department, more than three quarters of a million people in Wisconsin are enrolled in some form of Badger Care. That's the federal and state Medicaid program enacted 15 years ago to provide coverage for the working poor. Its enrollment has surged, prompting the current administration in Wisconsin to try to cut back because of its cost. In all, more than a million people in Wisconsin are on some form of Medicaid. But even with more federal Medicaid money directed at states in the Affordable Care Act, Governor Scott Walker has said he won't decide whether to participate until after the November elections. And that was Wisconsin Public Radio's Sean Johnson reporting. Now, after the elections, each of the candidates sitting here tonight would like to repeal the Affordable Care Act. There were, uh, that's where we're going to start the next round of questions. And for that, we go to Eric Hovde first for a reminder for 45 seconds. Are there any prongs of the Affordable Care Act that, that you support, specifically some of the ones that seem to be more popular, uh, including the provision of covering young adults or, or coverage for pre-existing conditions? No. I believe that the problem with our health care sector over the last 30 years has been ever-increasing government involvement. The highest rate of inflation of any sector in our economy over the last 30 years has been health care. Higher education has been number two. What is the similarity between the two of them? Ever-increasing government expenditures. In fact, 60 cents on every dollar we spend today in our health care sector comes from the federal or state government. 
I've never seen Washington, D.C. manage anything well. Why do we think that they're going to soon manage the second largest, second largest sector in our economy? So I believe we need to get rid of it. Now, as it pertains to pre-existing conditions, I think what we can do is use a high-risk pool to insure those individuals. And for if somebody's renewing an insurance policy, that's a different uh, issue because then I think there should not be exclusion if you have a pre-existing condition. Mark Newman. I'm the only candidate in this race that has collected 25,000 petitions from folks in the state of Wisconsin to fight Obamacare starting way back when they were first debating this issue. I'm totally opposed to Obamacare and no, there are no provisions that I would keep in place. Um, you asked specifically about the 26-year-old part that's popular. I'm a business owner. I want the right to sit down with my employees and define what the best insurance policy is to meet their needs. I do not want the government coming into our lives and into our boardrooms where I'm sitting down with our employees telling us specifically what we have to include in that insurance policy and what we don't have to include. Look, if somebody wants to include up to 26-year-olds on their insurance plans and that's what the employees and the, and the owner of that business decide, more power to them, let them buy a policy that does it. But please, don't let the government come into our boardrooms and dictate and mandate what we include in our business uh, insurance policies. Tommy Thompson. I testified to Congress against uh, a mandate and on the health care May 6, 19, uh, 2006 or 2008. And you know something? Health care is a very complicated subject. But the Affordable Care Act was put together as a Democrat bill. I could have you all in stitches though I went through and told you how it was developed. It was a Democrat bill, a partisan bill that never had a public hearing, never went through the communities or the, the conference committee to work it out. The Affordable Care Act has 20 taxes in it, it is over-regulated, and it's not going to help. What we need to do is repeal it and then write a plan. I've got a plan up. I know health care, and the United States Senate leadership has told me they can't wait till I get there to help draft a plan that's going to be on market-based conditions. Jeff Fitzgerald. I would also vote to repeal Obamacare, and this is something I've been fighting for a long time. Uh, here in Wisconsin, there was a provision called Healthy Wisconsin. Senate Democrats came up, which would have been Obamacare for Wisconsin. I was one of the people that helped fight uh, to, to, to not have that here in Wisconsin. But the problem we see with our health care system right now is it's not market-driven. We need a market base. I don't trust the government or insurance companies to make health care decisions for me and my family. What we have to do is put people back in charge of their health care. You know, one of the things we passed this year was health savings accounts. It would allow an employer uh, to get away from that use it or lose it mentality. $1,500 for a family plan that goes into account for you. You're in control of those dollars. can take it with you if you transfer for a job. Plus, there's transparency. You need to know what a procedure is going to cost, and you're in charge of those dollars. We need to put the marketplace back into health care. Tommy Thompson, you know you've come under some criticism for initially talking about mandates and the possibility of mandates on health care. So when you talk about this subject, how can anyone have sort of a legitimate debate if you're going to talk about ideas? So when you talk about bringing other people to the table, how do you get both sides to find an agreement that it's not just going to be a Republican plan and, or a Democratic plan? I did this all the time that I was governor, Charles. You know that. Uh, the Democrats were in control of both houses of the legislature out of 12 and a half years out of my 14 years. And we were able to pass welfare reform, health care reform, badger care. I was able to get through the legislature with Democrats in control of both houses. You have to sit down and listen. And in regards to the individual mandate, that I was supporting was a state mandate. This was a federal mandate that I testified against in 2008. What you've got to do is you've got to be able to come up with a health care system that's market-based. You've got to change the direction of health care. Right now, 92% of the health cost of health care goes into getting you well after you get sick. I want to make sure that we change that and put it into wellness and prevention and keep people well first. That is going to save billions of dollars, make America healthier, and create a much better uh, market-based and a much more competitive system. I know this has come up in the uh, campaigns, but do any one of you, this is an open-ended question, any one of you think anyone standing next to you would not repeal the Health Care Act? We all, all supposed right. to answer at the same time. Right? No, I mean, do, do you think somebody else, anybody standing next to you, do you think anyone standing next to you would not repeal the Health Care Act? I don't. No. I, tell me if you do. Do you think anyone standing next to you would repeal it? Would not repeal it. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, let me give you a hypothetical that came up in the Tea Party presidential debate last year. A 30-year-old person is out of work and has no insurance. He's suddenly struck ill and would die without proper care. 
if he goes into a coma, who should pay for it? And maybe even a broader question. Who should, a pay, who should pay for someone who doesn't have the ability to take care of themselves? And this will go to Mark Newman. Sure, I'd be happy to start. Um, when we wrote our budget plans when I was in Congress, the conservative alternatives to the Republicans' plans, um, we prioritized defense spending. But we also took into account that there would be people in America that are physically and mentally not able to take care of themselves. And I honestly believe as a conservative Republican that our hearts are open to those people in America that are not physically or mentally able to take care of themselves. And while we feel very strongly that the people that are physically and mentally able to take care of themselves, that it's their responsibility to take care of themselves, and it's their responsibility to take care of their families, but those that are not physically or mentally able to take care of themselves, I think everybody sitting in this room would be willing to open their wallet and help them pay for it, and I think that is an appropriate role of government where people are not able to take care of themselves. I'm very much in the corner of personal responsibility if one is physically and mentally able to do so. Tommy Thompson. Charles, the federal government has got Medicare, the federal government and state government has got Medicare and Medicaid, and both of these kind of programs are set up to help the poorest of the poor. Medicaid was set up to help those individual mothers and children who couldn't take care of themselves. That's why we have a Medicaid system. That's the safety net. In regards to people that have some kind of debilitating disease, mentally or physical, the United States government has passed many laws, the EMTALA law, the Medicare law, the, the Medicaid law. All of these are set up to help the poorest of the poor and individuals that cannot take care of themselves. There's nobody in America that doesn't have the compassion to take care of individuals that need it. And that's what the system set up. But you've got to get back to personal responsibility and people have to have some skin in the game and they have to start taking care of themselves or that is what's going to break the system. Well, I think this is a great question because I really believe that this is what the presidential election is going to be about. This is what these U.S. Senate races across the country are going to be out. Of what kind of country are we? Are we going to be what I believe our founding fathers wanted us to be, to be a limited government? With, as the governor said, that safety net to catch people such as this question? Absolutely. What we're seeing, though, is the problem of, are we going to become a European society, where now we're looking at cradle to grave, government participating in everything? I don't believe in that. I think it's creating a, a culture and a generation of complacency. So let's go back to what our founding fathers wanted us to be, limited government with a safety net that provides that safety net for those folks that would, would get into trouble. Look, I echo every one of the candidates' comments. As a person who started a foundation, has built homeless shelters for street children around the world, homeless shelters here in this state, and done a whole host of things, bought a car for Meal on Wheels. Of course, I have a big heart and compassion for those that are struggling. But I think as Jeff's comment said, are we going to be a, a country of makers or takers? For those that are truly struggling, that don't have the economic means, you have a safety net, as Governor Thompson talked about. Medicare, Medicaid. But if you have the economic means to care for yourself, we have to ha start getting back to self-reliance, independence, because otherwise we're gonna continue to slip down that slope that Europe has. We move on to the next question. This one goes first to Tommy Thompson. Governor Scott Walker says he's waiting to see how the November elections turn out before he decides whether to implement health care exchanges required under the Affordable Care Act. And he has turned back 38 million federal dollars to help implement them. Was that the right decision? And if so, what is wrong with state-run <clears throat> health exchanges? I never question a setting governor. <laughs> I've been there and know that it's very difficult. You should always uh, try and support the governor. But let's take a look at it. I've got a plan out there, Frederica, that's going to allow individuals to go up and put up on the line on your web page exactly what kind of insurance you want. The kind of cost deductible. You should make that decision, not the government. What kind of positions and what kind of policies you want, what provisions, and put it up and allow insurance companies around America to bid on it. And then put it up for a final bid. Have a reverse auction. And you will drive down the cost of health insurance and you will allow more people to be covered with health insurance than ever before. Exchanges can work at the state level, but not at the federal level. And I'm sure Scott Walker is going to be doing something because the federal law, unless we change it, unless we get people elected to repeal Obamacare, is going to have to do something. 
Jeff Fitzgerald? Yeah, well, when we look at Medicare and Medicaid, I, I think you can also look at exchanges, but look at a private exchange because we need to get market-based driven back into health care so that people are in control of those dollars. So, you know, I've, I've signed on and endorsed the Paul Ryan plan that allows for a voucher system uh, where you are, according to your income level, provided that voucher. Um, I, that also allows for, for state-run exchanges that you will be able to pool and purchase your health care from those exchanges. So exchanges can work, but not a government exchange that is a top-down government once again getting in the way. We need entitlement reform, serious entitlement reform in this country. And I think when you go to putting Obamacare on top of what we already have from entitlements, it will bankrupt this country. Eric Hovde? I applaud Scott Walker. We have to try to defund every aspect of Obamacare. When President Obama passed Obamacare with Nancy Pelosi, they said that it will actually save our country money over the next decade. How did they arrive at that? They factored in 10 years worth of tax revenues and only six and a half years worth of expenses. If a public company CEO did that, that is fraud. They would be thrown in jail. It's fundamentally wrong. So. As it pertains to the Medicare system, I don't have a lot of time, but I do agree with Paul Ryan on the premium support system. I think it's the way to go where you can buy a base level of, uh, of services. I see I'm running out of time, so I'll pass it on. First off, I think Scott Walker's doing exactly the right thing. I think he's done a great job as governor. Um, when he talk about putting those into place or not putting them into place, he realizes that if they elect conservative senators like myself, page three of our plan, top line, this plan balances the budget in five years by cutting $1.4 trillion of spending and repealing Obamacare. Page three, line one, repeals Obamacare. So if they elect conservatives like myself to the United States Senate, uh, he's absolutely correct in understanding and assuming that we are going to repeal the Obamacare bill. I think he's going down the right road exactly. And one more thing. When I've attended our Tea Party meetings, one of them came up to me after I said we need to repeal Obamacare. And they said, you know, you really need to explain yourself better. When I say we're going to repeal Obamacare, I mean repeal the law. I mean defund it, and I mean take apart the bureaucracy that's been put in place by Barack Obama because otherwise they're going to try and implement it anyway. All right, let's talk about uh, birth control and who should pay for it. As you know, that's a big debate in the country right now. We're going to begin with, I believe, uh, Jeff Fitzgerald. You will have this first question, or this next question. Uh, do you support Republican U.S. Senator Roy Blunt's amendment that would allow any employer with moral objections to opt out of coverage for birth control in their company policies? If so, why? And then the other question would be, then, should women have to pay for this out of pocket? Yeah, I, I think when you look at it, when you look at a perspective of, of whether it's a conscious, we, we, we uh, face this uh, on the state level of, of the conscious clause. I do believe that people that have a re religious belief and an objection uh, to what they want to do should not be forced by the government to, to have to go ahead and do that. So uh, I, I believe that that should come first, uh, your conscience, your beliefs, your religion, uh, when, it, when it comes to that. So, Do you mean that for religious organizations or even private sector companies as well? I believe that it should be, have the ability, if you are working for a company and, and you have that conscious decision to not want to administer it or, or per, perform that or, or administer it, I guess uh, that I would believe that they shouldn't have to do that. I don't believe any private sector company or organization be, should be forced to provide birth control. I'm fine with individuals using birth control. That's their individual choice. But we seem to have forgotten our First Amendment right, a freedom of religion. And why should we impose that on the private sector? Does the, is it re, a requirement of the private sector to buy somebody a car, to buy their food, to buy their home? No, that is a choice of that individual. And I think it's just an encroachment by our government to continue to push more weight and responsibilities on the private sector when it needs to be the individual's responsibility. For heaven's sakes, get government out of the way. Government has no business in this debate. Business owners should decide what they want in their insurance policies, not the federal government. That, that part of this bill, however, and that part of this discussion goes farther than just birth control. Under this program, they are requiring our religious institutions to provide abortion-causing drugs as part of their insurance plans and dispersing from their hospital. I quote the First Amendment, and I carry it with me because I really believe in our Constitution. First Amendment says Congress shall make no law 
respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Barack Obama is walking all over our Constitution when he is requiring our religious institutions to violate their fundamental belief that life begins at conception and Barack Obama must be stopped. This goes to the essence of this campaign and the presidential campaign. Basically this, who is going to be running our personal lives? Is it going to be the federal government? United, under Barack Obama, he has tried to make us all part of an entitlement society. He would like to have 50% of the people on an entitlement society, 50% pay. And then he is in the government, under Affordable Care Act, he would like to tell the churches, tell the businesses, tell the individuals what you can do, what you can buy, what you have to buy. Now, to me, this goes absolutely against the Constitution, goes absolutely against the free enterprise system, and is why a lot of us decided to run for public office again. We don't like the direction the federal government is going, and I want to stop it, and I know I can, and that's why I'm running. Our next question goes uh, first to Eric Hovde, and it is, now if people are not required to buy health insurance through a mandate, how do you encourage them to buy it and be covered? Well, that's tough. <clears throat> because it's one of those things in our country's history that if people didn't buy health insurance, then they wouldn't get necessarily the quality of care unless it was dependent upon the kindness of somebody's heart. Um, the simple fact is people have to take the responsibility for their own actions. We can't control as a society everything somebody does. And it's wrong to have other individuals be forced to provide assistance to an individual that is fully capable of providing for themselves than to step in when they've made a faulty decision in their life. I hate to quote the Constitution twice in a row here, but uh, the 10th Amendment to our Constitution says that anything that's not specifically enumerated as a power of the federal government, then it should not be done by the federal government, then that right belongs to the state and more importantly to the people. So when you're asking the question, should the federal government mandate the coverage of insurance, it seems to me that since it is not written anywhere in here that they have that power or that ability, that therefore they do not have it under the 10th Amendment to our Constitution. Um, having said that, how do we deal with that problem? The single most important thing that we can do in this country is to get our budget balanced so there's money in the private sector because when there's money in the private sector, jobs will be created and when jobs are created, there will be competition for employees and when there's competition for employees, they will be able to get jobs that include insurance as we do at our business and so many other businesses across this country. Tommy Thompson. Very simply, Liz. Health insurance is very expensive today, but if you allow for competition, if you allow for a reverse auction like I'm talking about, allowing individuals to determine what kind of health insurance they want, put it out for bids across state lines. Right now we're restricted to purchase health insurance within the state of Wisconsin that are registered here. A lot of companies would love to bid on, on people that are uninsured. You could have a pool there and you could have a very competitive, you could drive down the mark, drive down the cost of health insurance. Number two, what you have to do is you've got to be able to build the economy, create the jobs so that people have money to buy health insurance. You're never going to be able to buy health insurance with people that are laid off and don't have any inclination of getting a job because of the two uh, of the year of unemployment that they receive. Jeff Fitzgerald. Yeah, you know, when we look at all these questions, I still think all this flows back to, to jobs in the economy and, and the way to get people back to work again. You know, what we've experienced here at the, in state government, and I've experienced as Speaker of the State Assembly, the one thing that throws our budget off all the time is Medicaid from the federal government. We don't know what those roles are going to look like, but it all hinges on how the economy works. So if we get back to a robust economy, we get more competitive again and get people working again, they're going to go to work, they're going to have that insurance provided to them. Um, I also agree with Eric, there's got to be a personal responsibility uh, with this. But it seems that every question, or at least uh, the last questions, we have to determine, are we going to be a country that provides a safety net? Or are we going to interfere with everybody's lives and say, let's just let government take care of everybody? That's the fundamental question that I think you're going to see in this election. we got to choose what kind of country we're going to be. We're going to have the final question here, and we're going to go with uh, Eric Hovde will answer this. I'm sorry. I think it's Mark Newman. I'm sorry, Mark Newman. Mark my, my apologies. As you know, Medicare Part D, which covers prescription drugs for seniors, was one of the largest expansions of the federal government under the Bush administration. 
Um, if that program came up for a vote today, or if there was talk of trying to change it, expand it, improve it, would you support it? You know, that's a fundamentally very important question, because if we understand that that got passed with no offsets to pay for it, we will understand what's wrong in the government today. When you look at Medicare Part D, and you have a discussion about it, you can't just have that discussion out in the open by itself. What you need to do is have that discussion as it relates to other priorities in spending. So if you want to have the discussion, should we eliminate Medicare Part D? And is that more important then or less important than something else that we might eliminate in the budget? The 150 items I've got laid out in our plan to balance the federal budget, they didn't deal with Medicare Part D. We get the job done without dealing with that and without uh, getting rid of that. But the point, the point that I would make in this discussion is that when you're talking about eliminating an important program, what you need to do is talk about it in the frame reference of the big picture of how you're going to get to a balanced budget and then ask the question that we all ask in all of our families we're going to spend money. Is that program more important than something else that I don't have to do that I can save the money over there instead? So it's prioritizing the spending. Tommy Thompson. Medicare Part D was a, a very important program because up until that time, seniors could not purchase drugs. They were not having the kind of health care. And what was happening is seniors that couldn't get the drugs and couldn't afford them were going into the hospital, going into the emergency ward, driving up health care costs. Part D accomplished a great deal. 88% of the seniors in America like it. It has held down costs of health care, and it's also going to hold down costs much more so than what CBO ever recommended. And, I'm, and I want to tell the people that Part D does work. It was one of the first times that we ever had a competitive model in Medicare. We had companies bidding for that kind of business. And we had more companies come in to bid on Part D than we've ever had before, and it actually drove down the prices. The free market does work. Yeah, I, I agree with Governor Thompson I, and, and Mark Newman that you have to prioritize when you're looking at an entire budget and when you look at the entire health care system. Uh, that was an important part for seniors. Uh, we did see there was a problem. Uh, we have a program senior care here in the state of Wisconsin that was a very successful program that now we've seen a lot of seniors shift from that over into Medicare Part D. But no, this is something you have to pro prioritize and, and is a, a vital part of what I think seniors look for uh, that we saw escalating drug prices and I, I agree with Governor Governor Thompson. Now that has brought competition in there that has drove down the price of, the, of that drug care and is something that we, we need to look at uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Eric Hupty. I was fundamentally upset by the fact that they did, had caught, created no offsets to fund regulation Part D, prescription Part D. But here's where I'm really troubled by it. Our federal government was not allowed to negotiate with Big Pharma on the purchase of those drugs. And not only that, there was a rider put in that prevented the federal government from buying drugs from Canada, which does negotiate with Big Pharma, that typically buys their drugs at a 40% discount. So as a result, in my view, it was way too much of a gift to Big Pharma at the expense of the taxpayers. All right, that will uh, wrap up the hour now, and uh, we now will go to the closing <clears throat> statements. You'll each get 45 minutes. That is a change based on the time. 45 seconds, I'm sorry, 45 seconds. We like 45, 45 minutes. minutes. 45 yeah. seconds. Yeah, even less if we keep laughing. Now, the closing statements was determined by uh, who could do the most push-ups. Actually, it was a lottery. <laughs> and Jeff Fitzgerald won. Well, thank you for having this uh, debate this evening, and uh, I can tell you, as you can tell, you're not going to see us differ much on policy decisions here uh, from all four of us. And I can tell you, what people ask me is, how are you different from the other three candidates in this race? And I can tell you, I'm different because I'm battle-tested. I was one of the guy, three guys that was in the room when I decided we were going to take this state back. The other two were Governor Walker and my brother, Scott Fitzgerald, who's in the crowd. Thanks for being here. We decided that we were going to take on the tough decisions and get this state back on the track. We need to do the same on the federal level as well. Because guess what? People are fed up with politicians that say one thing to get elected on the campaign trail and then do another. We need leadership. We need to, to look at our problems, face our problems, and move on and get this country back on the right direction. Eric Hupty. Sadly, our country is facing an economic crisis, a very serious economic crisis that could unfold in the next two to four years. It's time we start electing people to the United States Senate that understands economics in the private sector. I've built many different companies, creating hundreds of jobs. I've turned around over a dozen community banks. I've operated in the global financial markets. I understand the repercussions that are going to happen when Europe continues to crater. So I think it's critically important 
that we have people that understand those skills. And lastly, you have to understand why is somebody doing this? I'm not looking to take the next step in a political career or cap off my political career or desperately try to get into politics. I'm there to go serve and I want to serve my country. And lastly, I'd just like to say this is the last time we're going to be together as a series of candidates. It's been contentious at times, but I wish you all very well and Godspeed. Tommy Thompson, 45 seconds. Well, thank you. Thank all the candidates. We're all conservatives. We all got uh, philosophies that are very close. But the truth of the matter is the one question, who can win? Who can win in November? Who can take it to Tammy Baldwin and be elected? There's only one candidate up here that's ever run statewide and won. I won five times by big margins. And who is going to be able to defeat Tammy Baldwin? If you do not defeat Tammy Baldwin, Harry Reid is going to be the majority leader. Can you imagine the country we're going to have with Barack Obama if he's reelected? And I hope and pray he isn't. And Harry Reid is still in the majority leader in the United States Senate. It would be a disaster. We would continue to drive uh, towards a socialistic country and more fiscal imbalance. We need a senator. I can win. And I ask for your vote. Mark Newman. I'm going to close also answering the question I get asked all the time, how are you different than the other candidates standing here? I'm the only candidate in this race that has spent 30 years in Wisconsin meeting Wisconsin payroll and creating Wisconsin jobs. In addition to that, I'm the only candidate in this race that has spent four years in Washington, D.C., where I was one of the principal architects of balancing the budget and the plans to balance the budget, the only time in a generation that's actually been done. And third, I've taken the time to write a detailed plan with numbers in it that shows us how to get to a balanced budget in a five-year period of time by cutting spending and by repealing Obamacare. Folks, it's that experience that we're going to need. And what's happened because of those issues, the conservatives from around the country and around Wisconsin have lined up behind us. Tea Party Express, the conservative senators in the United States Senate today, Senator Rand Paul, Senator DeMint, Senator Mike Lee, have all endorsed our candidacy. I ask for your vote next week, and thank you all for putting this on. God bless America. We need to leave it there. Thank you to all the candidates. That concludes our debate for tonight. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night. And our other 2012 election coverage, go to wisconsinvote.org.